He promises. <laughs> <laughs> well, good afternoon and welcome to the fifth session of this special course, Political Science 216, um, a look at the 2020 presidential election. I'm really excited about our topic today on education in all of its aspects and levels and by the distinguished nature of our panel. My name is Joel Cassiola for the people viewing this for the first time. And I am a member of the Department of Political Science and it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, to this Zoom webinar. Before we get to our first panelist, I have two announcements to make uh, to the audience. The first concerns um, accessibility uh, to the recordings. I would like to announce that any viewer who, um, a viewer of this webinar who needs some accommodation to enhance their accessibility to the recordings to please let me know through my email. And my email address is my last name at sfsu.edu. And we will make every effort uh, to make the accommodation so that you can get the most out of the recordings. My second announcement concerns um, uh, is directed to the uh, enrolled students. And uh, it pertains to the first quiz uh, for this course. And uh, I just want to repeat the subject matter for the um, quiz is the first four weekly sessions, not this one, uh, which will be on the second quiz. I have been delaying posting the quiz because we had so many late ads that I want to give those students um, more opportunity to view uh, the recordings that they missed. Uh, and so my goal is to post the quiz next week and to give you about 10 days window to uh, take the quiz. What I will say now is please be alert to an email from me pertaining to the quiz in the next week. And um, if you have any questions or concerns to please write me on email uh, and I will address those concerns as soon as I can. So thank you to both the a non-enrolled student audience and the enrolled students. With that, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Sheldon Jen. Professor Jen is Associate Professor in the School of Public Affairs and Civic Engagement, who teaches in the Doctorate of Education and the Masters of Public Administration programs. He earned a PhD in public policy from Georgia Tech. He studies public engagement in policymaking, focusing on issues in the environment and education. Professor Jen is the lead author of a recently published book entitled Nonprofits in Policy Advocacy, Their Strategies and Stories, which one academic journal editor called, quote, one of the best books on nonprofit advocacy. And another journal editor described as a must read for researchers and students in public administration, political science, public policy, and sociology. Professor Jen is also a member of the Board of Education for Petaluma City Schools, the second largest school district in Sonoma County, with 18 schools serving 
7,500 students from transitional kindergarten to grade 12. Professor Jen is currently running for re-election to the board. So we are honored to have a sitting member of a board of education that with the opportunity to learn from his experience on the most important unit for making policy for schools, the school board. Professor Jen, I welcome you to today's webinar. Thank you, Joel. I really appreciate being on this panel, and being invited for it, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, it's it's um, interesting for me personally to be a, a scholar of public policy and now a sitting board member uh, because I get to see to what extent those two views of education are aligned or not aligned. And I think we're gonna see some of that in what I have to share today. So what I would like to share with our audience today is kind of a broad overview of K-12 education and its potential impact by the 2020 election. And in order to uh, have this, discuss this discussion, we have to first uh, understand the context the, 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 um, the government context in which uh, education policy exists. So I'm gonna start by um, describing uh, education in a federal structure of government because that structure really dictates a lot about how education policy works or doesn't work uh, in this country. And then I'm gonna introduce this concept of co-production in K-12 education because that too helps us understand the ways in which a government can or does not support uh, public education. And then with that, uh, with those concepts uh, in mind, we, we can start then to talk about the major issues that we're facing in K-12 education today. First, foremost, of course, is the pandemic and the resulting recession, which is a double blow to public education. So we'll talk about that. I do want to bring in the BLM movement and, and structural racism that uh, has come to a forefront in our broader community and has real implications in our public school systems. And it's closely related to the concept of opportunity gaps. And then we'll close up my portion by taking a view of uh, presidential considerations on K-12 education with our presidential election coming up as well as the California propositions. There are some important propositions that have implications on public education uh, that, um, for us in California. So first, let's talk about uh, delivering public education in a federal system. Uh, the roles and powers of local, state, and national governments in public education have changed dramatically over the last two centuries. It began with local government dominance over uh, K-12 education, which lasted well into the 1900s. But within the last 50 years or so, it has evolved into state dominance in K-12 education for about half the states. The other half still have local dominance on K-12 education. And then another phenomenon in the last 50 years is the growing influence of the national government in K-12 education because before, there was hardly any role at all for the federal government. So in this table, I, this is a very generalized view of the roles of different levels of government in the delivery of K-12 or public education in general. And the items in the table that are purple and italicized, uh, those are the K-12 roles that each level of government has. And the items in black uh, are the higher education roles that um, major roles that the levels of government have. I'm gonna stick my uh, talk just in the purple on the K-12. I know we have another panelist who's gonna be talking about the president of our university, gonna be talking about higher education uh, impacts. But looking at the K-12 um, system, we see that the local government across the country still has a major critical role in the delivery of public education, even if they aren't uh, the top role. And, and that role is, of course, delivering at public education. They're still the ones who build the schools, who hire the teachers, who enroll the students, and actually deliver education. 
they are also the primary source of revenue for our K-12, K-12 system through the property tax. State governments uh, have a very large role also in that they are primarily responsible for curriculum standards for K-12 education and for financing education. Uh, certainly uh, uh, with general funds from income, sales, and, and other types of taxes. And in some states, like in California, they also have the responsibility of redistributing local property taxes across the state. So in this state, uh, even if, if you own property, you write your check out to the county assessor, but that money gets redistributed to, to the uh, by the state across the, the state. Uh, and then the, you see in the national uh, government, their roles in, high, uh, in K-12 education has really been recent in the last few decades. And, and really um, their focus has been on uh, uh, standards and accountability for schools and school systems. As it, you've probably heard of the Common Core, which is a part of the most recent uh, edition, or sorry, the Obama edition of the Education uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act uh, that, that uh, created kind of a, a curricular standard across the country that states could uh, uh, voluntarily adopt. They're also involved with uh, aspects of educational equity, particularly in supporting students uh, who are low income. Uh, and so they are the primary sources for the free and reduced lunch uh, program, uh, but also a major source of funding for special education as well. So there are all three levels of government are involved in K-12 education, but it's predominantly state and local government that have the primary responsibilities. So in a presidential election, that already helps think about what role does a president have in K-12 education? And the answer is not a ton compared to state and local governments. And this graph really illustrates that point. It looks at last year's California K-12 budget um, uh, based upon the level of government that, that generated those revenues. And so you can see the state is dominant. 58% of K-12 education is distributed by, from, from state funds. Um, local government is second, and then the federal government is a distant, distant third place, accounting for only 8% of expenditures at the K-12 level. With that, uh, with that understanding of the different roles, uh, different levels of government and their roles in education, we also have to look outside of government uh, for, uh, to understand how public education is delivered. And in, um, in education studies, we have this concept of co-production. And, and we say that education is always co-produced. And what we mean by that is, Education is not uh, just that traditional idea of a teacher standing in front of a class, conveying his or her knowledge to students and these students being these empty buckets uh, that are willing to be filled with, with knowledge. It, it is not that kind of a dynamic. Co-production recognizes that a student's success in their education is a function of many things, including a lot of things that happen outside of school. And there's a lot of research that is uh, devoted to this co-production of education and, and in some fields call it the education production function. But in general, what I have listed here are the major factors in a student's life that tend to be associated with their success in education. So first and foremost is the student, indeed. There, you know, the differences in the student's behaviors and attitudes do indeed impact their ability to succeed in school. But they are in no way the sole uh, determinant. In fact, when you add up the rest, it becomes a more dominant uh, factor. And those rest of the things are the adults in the students' lives. First their families, then their teachers and their schools, then their broader communities, including their local government businesses and nonprofits that support their families and the communities. And then even the state and national governments to the extent that those levels of government support community development and families and schools at the local level. 
And so the delivery of education is not solely dependent on, uh, on how we support public schools. It's also dependent upon how we support families, their livelihoods, and communities. And that's very important to understand because when we look at presidential candidates or propositions on the state ballot, it's not just the ones that talk about revenues to education that have an impact on, on student success. It has to do with all those things that support families, their livelihoods, and the communities uh, around them. And uh, the, the, the opposite is also true in that the, the, to the extent that we don't support those things around a child's life, our communities are going to pay for the outcomes uh, of uh, those students' lack of success in education. And so here we have uh, briefly um, uh, the results of a study that, that I have taken and extrapolated to the, to the present day. And this was a pair of economists that were trying to estimate the social cost to community um, uh, for uh, inade inadequately educated children. And through their calculations, they discovered that for every additional child who does not graduate from high school, here are the costs to society across the life of that student. And so for every additional student that we don't graduate from K-12 education, uh, we, the community loses $191,000 in lost tax revenues because that person isn't making as, enough, uh, enough, uh, as much money as they would if they had graduated. They're not buying as much stuff as they would if they had graduated. They're not paying as much in taxes. We are gonna spend 55,000 more in healthcare because that person is going to draw, have more needs for healthcare than somebody who does graduate from high school. We're gonna spend $36,000 more on criminal justice system because that person will more likely be a victim of crime or a perpetrator of crime. And then we're gonna spend $4,000 more in welfare because that person is going to be demanding more from our welfare system. And so the total present value of every additional person who doesn't graduate from high school is about $287,000. And what that means is we in the K-12 system, we can spend up to $180,000 or $280,000 per child to graduate, and we would still break even, do better than break even. Uh, the, reality, the reality is today in California, we're spending about $130,000 uh, per student through their 12th grade education. And so, uh, you know, our return on investment is like 200%. This is a very good idea to, to be on this end of investment. And, and I put a picture here of, Kamala Harris, because she really understood this. Uh, and, and this is a quote from her when she was district attorney. And Joel will remember this, but when she was first elected to uh, district attorney of San Francisco, she came to our faculty convocation at San Francisco State. It was either 2004, 2005. I tried to dig it out in my records. I couldn't figure it out. So it's about 2004. <laughs> but she came to our convocation and was talking about her role as the prosecutor, lead prosecutor in San Francisco. And she made a statement that really stuck in my mind all these years. She said, she said to us, the faculty at San Francisco State, we are in the same business, which kind of shocked me because she's in criminal justice and I'm in education. But her point was this, we uh, are going to pay for the outcomes of uh, all of our children, whether they are good or bad. And the choice is which, we, <laughs> which of those outcomes do we want? And she said, we can either pay it up front by supporting them in their education, and we will get reap all these benefits that I've listed on the, on the top here, you know, $191,000 more in tax revenues and savings of, in healthcare and criminal justice or welfare. Or if we fail on that K-12 education, we're going to pay for them on my end, on the criminal justice side of things. And in her view, it was much smarter uh, uh, approach to pay for it upfront by supporting students in their educational development so that they can be full members of society after graduation. I really appreciated that, that perspective that was coming from the lead prosecutor uh, in San Francisco at the time. So with that context of how education fits into 
the federal structure and this idea of co-production, let's talk a little bit about the major issues that K-12 education is facing today. Uh, the pandemic is what's dominating every <laughs> a school board across the state these days, probably across the country. Uh, in fact, right after this, uh, this panel, I have to go to my own school board meeting and, and sure enough, we're talking about distance learning and, and trying to grapple with how we're gonna deal with uh, this pandemic. Uh, the pandemic is having really two major impacts on K-12 education, one on the fiscal side and one on the teaching and learning side. On the fiscal side is uh, we see on the horizon some very steep cuts coming down in K-12 education. Uh, this academic year, 2020 and 2021, has largely spared K-12 education. It hasn't spared higher education, and Dr. Mahoney will, will likely talk about that. But the legislature spared, and the governor spared K-12 um, education this academic year, largely through some budgetary um, shuffling around. They essentially are going to defer payments to K-12 education, uh, which is a fancy way of saying uh, they're going to maintain the level of expenditures in K-12 education this year as it was for last year, uh, but you're not going to get all those payments at once as you normally would. We're going to pay you back some of it in the, in the future. So it's kind of a promise that they're, gonna, they're going to um, backfill that amount of, um, of budget. But the state is warning us. They said, uh, you should spend this year in preparation for what's to come because 2021-22 academic year, that budget is going to be based upon tax revenues from 2020, this current calendar year. And the tax revenues for this year, we know are going to be horrendous. And we want to see a, a dramatic drop in, in revenues because so many people are unemployed. And so, and people aren't spending, even if they are employed, they're not spending. So uh, that is, uh, we expect to see deep cuts in the next two fiscal years, at least. Uh, optimistic uh, economists are expecting that, you know, as soon as this pandemic is declared over, the, the rebound in the economy will be much faster than it was for the Great Recession. You know, I, I'm, I'm, it's, you know, optimists and economists aren't usually words that you put together, but and I'm thankful for those economists who are that optimistic, but I think we have to plan for possibly a long, much longer term uh, uh, dip in our budgets. The other major impact, of course, is on teaching and learning. Um, in the higher education, relatively speaking, I think it's been an easier transition to go to distance learning because it was already a part of our model of, of, of delivery. That wasn't the case in K-12. We didn't have any distance learning models in K-12 uh, mm -hmm. education. And so we had to pivot quickly in spring. It was ugly uh, and it, wasn't, it was better than nothing, but it wasn't great. Um, thankfully, uh, a lot of districts uh, um, spent their summers wisely and, and were gearing up for distance learning. And, and at least in my district, what I'm hearing from our families is, uh, this distance learning 2.0 that started in the fall is a different beast than it was in the spring, much better and much, um, uh, much more acceptable, uh, but still not great. And so we are still um, uh, seeing uh, some impacts, a lot of impacts from this distance learning. We're seeing a larger burden of education being placed on families. We already mentioned that families are a part of the education production function, they're part of co-production, but under distance learning, they have a heavier role than they're used to in pre-pandemic times. We are really concerned about learning losses. The state uh, said uh, for this entire academic year in the K-12 system, the state said, you are no longer required to have 360 minutes of instructional times per day for the upper grade levels. That has been reduced to 240 minutes. What, what happened to those other two hours? Those other two hours are what we call lost instructional time and, and it's called learning loss. That on top of uh, the recent shutdowns of schools from um, public safety power shutoffs and from the wildfires and from smoke, uh, smoky skies, all these things add up and accumulate as lost instructional time that is impacting our students. Uh, in my district, PG&E told us 
that we should expect 10 days of power shutoffs per year for the next 20 years. That's how long it's going to take them to, uh, to reinforce their, uh, the power grid in ways that uh, can withstand uh, arid conditions and high winds. And so if you add up 10 days per year of lost instructional times over across over a span of 13 years in the life of a student's education, you've lost almost a year of education by the time you reach 12th grade. And that doesn't even count the impacts of the pandemic. And so this is something that we are really grappling with that has been accentuated by the pandemic. And so uh, this is, um, this is daunting and, and we and, and uh, districts are learning from each other and, and kind of learning on the fly as well. The distance learning has really shifted the burden of education to different families and the experience of different families, uh, the experience of education to different families. And I just want to illustrate this with these two letters of the many I get every day. But these two letters struck me because I got them almost simultaneously in my email box. And they are two different families' reflections on how distance learning has been so far in this semester. And the first one, you know, I'll, I'll just read an excerpt from it. it. says, I'm ready to tell you about the incredible experience my children are having in distance learning. And she goes on to say, I can't believe it. I was a skeptic. But my kids, as she says, my kids are not only loving schools, but they are learning at rapid rates. And I was feeling really good about myself. And then I opened up the next email. And here she says, I'm writing this letter as a concerned parent and concerned citizen about this, this distance learning. I'm not outraged by the fact that our schools are not open yet. And at the bottom she says, enough is enough. Put our children's education first, open our schools, no more distance learning, no more Zooms. <laughs> the, the reflections could not be any more diverse. And the reality is both are true. Different families are struggling in distance learning, some thriving in it, some really not prepared for it at all. And the reality is, as, as a public education system, we are charged to serve every one of those families. And so this is the challenge that we face. BLM and racism, of course, is another major issue. I see I'm running out on time, so I want to quickly go through the last few slides. Um, this uh, is associated with the opportunity gaps that has been persistent throughout the history of education. And part of that persistence is kind of an unwillingness to understand the co-production nature of education. And instead, a lot of our, po our policies focus on the individual performance of the students and of the teachers. And, you know, better teachers will result in better outcomes, better students and, you know, results in better outcomes. It, it ignores the fact that our students live in a community uh, that are influenced by racism, by inequalities, and that affects their, their lives. And so uh, the BLM movement that we've seen in this year has accentuated a long-standing problem that we've seen in education opportunity gaps. Very quickly, you know, you can look at the web pages of our two presidential candidates, the major candidates, and uh, on Biden's side, you'll see uh, a lot of clues, uh, not a lot of details, but a lot of clues that he understands the co-production nature of education. I think part of that uh, has to do with the fact that he's married to a career educator in, in, um, in community colleges. And so you look down at his platform, uh, it's rich with ideas. I'm not sure where the funding is going to come for, uh, from, but he talks about tripling Title I funding, you know, which is for low-income families, doubling co-curricular staff like psychologists, nurses, and schools. These are wonderful, wonderful ideas that uh, understand the co-production nature of education. Uh, I have to question how this is going to happen. You know, I, I want to believe it. I have to question how it's going to happen. On Trump's side, it's very thin on their education platform, but we don't have to rely on what's printed on their website because we have four years of experience in this administration to, to, to make some kind of a judgment. And the best proxy for that judgment, I think, is Trump's Secretary of Education, who is Betsy DeVos, who, factually speaking, has no experience in public education as either a student, a parent, a teacher, or an administrator. And in fact, she is quite clearly based upon her agenda in her tenure there is really an advocate for private schools and, and private 
privatization of K-12 education. And so her you know, primary um, actions have been towards greater public private school choice, including the use of public funds to, to help students go to private schools. Uh, um, on the positive side from my, from my view is this administration did uh, pass the CARES Act in response to COVID, uh, which was a good start. It's not enough. Uh, it did shore up some you know, emergency needs uh, for K-12 education, but uh, it's, it isn't enough. And then here, lastly, on this last slide here, uh, I've highlighted some uh, propositions on California's ballots that have implications for education. The most direct ones are, are Prop um, 15 and Prop 16. Those are the ones that are most directly affect education. Prop 15, of course, is the one that would change uh, property tax assessments on a certain commercial uh, properties. And the Legislative Analyst Office uh, estimates that that would be about a 10% boost in, um, in property tax revenue. That's substantial. 10% is substantial. Prop 16 is essentially a repeal of Prop 209 in 1996, which outlawed um, race uh, as a factor in making decisions on education. And so that would certainly um, impact education in terms of equity. I'm going to uh, stop there, Joel, because I see that I'm, I'm gone over on my time. Um, and, but I thank you for this opportunity to share. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sheldon. Um, I really appreciated the emails from the two parents. Uh, that's something uh, most faculty members uh, would not have available. Um, Sheldon mentioned that he, he needs to go to a board meeting uh, immediately thereafter. Um, if anyone has a question, uh, this would be the opportunity uh, to write in a question for Professor Jen before he needs to leave. And if we don't have any questions, I will say this, um, I will speak for Professor Jen and I hope I'm not out of order that if you have any questions, uh, you can email me and I will forward them uh, to Professor Jen. Sure. Happy That's to great. That. Yeah. Okay. Um, not seeing any, then you can go off to your uh, joyous meeting, uh, which uh, Professor Jen said could last three and a half or four and a half hours. Uh, so you will need some prep time. And I want to thank you very much uh, for that really enlightening presentation about what it means uh, to be responsible for K-12 to these days. Thanks a lot, Sheldon. Thank you, Joel. And now um, it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Professor Kathleen uh, Mortier. And um, uh, let me say a few words um, to introduce you to Professor Mortier. Um, Kathleen Mortier is assistant professor in the extensive support needs program in the Department of Special Education and project director of California Deaf Blind Services. She received her MA at SF State and her PhD at the University of Ghent in Belgium. Her dissertation topic was creating supports for students with disabilities in general education classrooms from an expert to a partnership model. Her research interests are inclusive education, communities of practice, family school partnerships for Latinx families with children with disabilities, and literacy instruction for students with extensive support needs. Two recent publications uh, that Professor Mortier uh, produced, the Lat Latino community is not accustomed to arguing for the rights of their children, how Latina mothers navigate special education, and communities of practice, a conceptual framework 
for inclusion of students with significant disabilities. I want to thank you, Professor Mortier, for uh, appearing this afternoon. I think one of the reasons why um, I thought your presence was important, we have not heard much uh, in the mass media about the impact of the pandemic and policies on special needs students. And I think your expertise uh, will really help enlighten the viewers' understanding of that big issue. So the floor is yours, Kathleen. Okay, well, thank you and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. So I will speak today as an ally for people with disabilities and also from my experience in the field of special education. So to understand the topics that I wanna to address today, um, I think we have to take a step back and think about how we view people with disabilities and also how they are viewed in our society. So the current uh, narratives uh, stem from a medical model. So, and fluctuating from seeing people with disabilities as heroes uh, who over, overcoming their disability or doing something amazing, um, or um, on the other side, um, people who are suffering victims who we pity. But not often do we um, hear from them as from a social justice per perspective that highlights the oppression that they're uh, facing and the barriers that people with disabilities encounter on a daily basis within our society. So we also have to kind of see these issues in um, a societal framework. So of a market economy model and a meritocracy in which people with disabilities are not really seen as contributors um, to the society and therefore are, are less valued. And, and this will have kind of implications on, on you know, um, election themes. So ableism, which is the centering of the non-disabled body as the norm in all aspects of life, <laughs> is like racism. It's a systemic problem that we are all part of and that affects all areas of life for people with disabilities. So important election topics um, will touch upon all of these inequities that um, people are facing in the different life domains. So affordable health care and never having to worry about losing your health care would be important. Getting rid of sub-minimum wages, which are still um, happening um, in the field affordable and accessible housing and transportation, um, meaningful job and career opportunities, also strong enforcement of accessibility and civil rights laws um, would be important, and then also real educational opportunity in integrated settings. Um, so basically, um, the first point I want to make is that um, people with disabilities should be seen as voters, and there should be something for them to vote for. And um, there should also be attention to voter suppression. So, because we wanna make sure that um, voting is accessible to, uh, to people with disabilities. So, but I was invited to speak about special education, um, which is my area. And um, so the good thing about special education is in the US is that since 1975, there's been a federal law called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act uh, IDEA, short, and is a law that allows free appropriate public education to eligible children in the US and ensures special education and related services like therapies, like speech therapy and so on. Uh, the interesting thing is that this law requires that the federal government covers 40% of the cost and then the states and the districts and the counties and uh, they pay the remaining 60%. So now for the last um, 45 years, the federal government has not met their 40% goal. So for example, in 2018-2019, uh, the federal funding only covered 8.4% of special education costs in California. So leaving the state and the districts to have to cover the rest, right? So this has put a tremendous stress on the system uh, leaving you know, the state and the districts to have to figure it out with such a limited amount of funds. And um, so, and often with teachers having to do quite an impossible job, and then ultimately 
children with special needs, um, you know, have, getting a poor quality education, having lack of services, and also lack of opportunities to be included in general education context, because that's another part of the law. So, um, you know, it would be huge and really cool if there would be a presidential candidate who could commit to fully funding the federal portion of IDA. So, you know, you should be looking out for that. And kind of as an extension of that is that, um, you know, special education has absolutely been hit the hardest by the pandemic because a lot of the students cannot access curriculum through distance learning. So they require constant support um, from their parents and there's real difficulty providing services like um, uh, physical therapy or speech services through the distance learning platform. So, and also another thing that happened is that many districts um, uh, cuts or um, laid off their paraeducators who are, who are really essential in supporting kids with disabilities, instead of kind of thinking creatively of how, how they could incorporate them, uh, incorporate them in the distance learning. Um, so the result of this is an incredible burden on families who are often in real, real crisis situations and they see their kids regress. And, um, and actually one thing that happened is that the current secretary, secretary of education suggested to take away their rights um, under IDEA as kind of a measure related to the pandemic because she thought it wouldn't be possible to provide those services. Luckily, there was a lot of opposition from the field and um, that didn't go through. But you know, that, that's the kind of thing that's, that could have happened. Um, so, you know, fully funding uh, the Individuals with Education Act is, is very important. Then um, I also want to talk about the Cogswell Macy Act. So um, a group of students that are particularly vulnerable during the pandemic, but also in general, are students who are deafblind. And so maybe, you know, as you're watching this webinar, you can close your eyes for a couple of minutes. And then also, in addition, kind of imagine that you also have hearing problems or that you're completely deaf. So then think about how would you learn and, and benefit from this webinar. Um, so California DeafBlind Services, which is based at San Francisco State University, is advocating together with partners uh, in the country to pass the Cogswell Macy Act. So, which amends um, the IDEA and to improve the education, identification and the services for children who have visual or hearing impairments or both. So, and to make sure that they have qualified personnel to serve them. So, for example, for students with, uh, who are deaf blind, um, instead of getting a regular paraeducator, they could get a trained intervener who could help them access the curriculum. Um, and in fact, one of the first intervener programs uh, in the country is running here at San Francisco State through the College of Extended Learning. Um, then another thing I want to touch upon, and all of these issues are kind of related, is um, the support for families. Because when there's scarcity and when there's lack, lack of funds, the families who suffer the most are those uh, families, uh, those low income families, immigrant families, and families of color. So not only is there overrepresentation of Black and Latinx students in special education, but uh, families who are in the system have to become almost legal experts to, um, or hire a legal expert if they, if they can afford that, if they want to advocate for um, equal services and support for their children. So um, you can imagine that this leads to huge inequities and often people of color are in that kind of process are faced with racism. So this leads to huge inequities and the federal government could actually support um, existing, existing family resource centers who do a great job, but they're terribly underfunded and who can really help um, bridge that gap and make a difference for those families. Um, so that's, that's another thing that's, that's you know, really important in addressing this inequity. Then another point I wanna bring up is um, the teacher shortage. So that's a huge issue in education, but in special education um, in particular. So for example, in the United States, 49 states report shortages of special education teachers. 
and enrollment in uh, teachers preparation programs um, is lower than at any point since they started taking data. So people, if any of you think about a career in special education, please come. We need really good people and it's a really amazing career. Um, and, um, you know, one of the problems is um, having to do with the lack of funds, right? Because often uh, there's a high level of attrition and um, people leaving, leave the profession because it's, it's difficult because there's not enough funding. Of course, some people stay on and do an amazing job. Um, attrition is higher in Title I schools and even higher in schools that serve mostly students of color. So um, for instance, um, so, so these students don't have equal access to uh, qualified teachers. So in California, for instance, uh, a lot of the um, teachers in special education don't even have a credential uh, because there's such a shortage. So um, the districts can hire somebody on an on a emergency permit that just lasts, lasts a year, but these people don't have any background in, in education or in special education often. And they're working with the, the students who have the most needs. Um, and if these people don't get to enter a teacher credential, credentialing program, then they don't get to um, stay in that job and then they just pick somebody else. But so just imagine um, how difficult that must be for um, these students in these programs, right? Um, so, but one of the things um, that the federal government does to address the teacher shortages and to improve outcomes for students with disabilities um, with high intensity needs and in low poverty schools is award uh, personnel preparation grants to teacher preparation programs. So this runs through the Office of Special Education Programs of the U.S. Department of, of um, Education. Um, so the um, special education department at San Francisco State has been really successful for years now, um, you know, winning those grants and they're very competitive and they're about $1 million and most of the funding goes directly to students who come into our programs, who get full tuition, who get uh, even a, a more specialized training based in evidence-based practices and interventions. So, however, um, why I'm raising this is that the last administration um, put in place a 10% matching fund requirement on top of, an, of a sliding scale of matching funds up to 50%. So this means that the, the universities who, who can put forward um, uh, more money and who can put forward more matching funds will, um, will, be, will have an advantage and will be getting access to this federal money. So this, this is hugely inequitable, inequitable because it favors institutions of higher ed that have more money and places CSUs out of the competition. While the purpose, the very purpose of these grants align perfectly with our work in low income schools that we have access to. So, um, and also what we've learned is that having these grants for students can also help diversify the teacher workforce because it, it makes you know, the, the education, um, the training program more affordable. And this is really you know, what one of our goals is. So, um, so that's really unfortunate. And you know, I've been trying to um, get funding and, and get that matching fund requirement, but we just, cannot, we just cannot do it. So we're really losing this great opportunity um, for our students because of this, um, of this new requirement that was put in by the current secretary. The issue of matching funds is also true for funding for inclusion programs for students with intellectual disabilities at institutions of higher education, which a lot of people on this campus would like to put in place. Um, we're starting with a very small project now, but um, you know, if we, if we really want to compete for those funds, they, again, they ask for a 25% matching fund, which again puts us at a disadvantage. Um, but, you know, we, we would be a great campus because we have the vision and the mission um, to, to uh, have a, a big diversity on our campus. Uh, the same is true for research grants that are um, offered through um, the institution, uh, Institute of uh, Educational Sciences, which favors our one institutions to do educational research, um, while actually we have the expertise and the access to the schools where this research should be happening. So then the last point that I want to address is that, um, and you know, the previous speaker spoke to this too, is that we need to protect uh, and fund our public education um, because that's really critical. Um, 
charter schools have been supported heavily by this administration. And this is particularly problematic for special education because private schools are not held accountable for the education of students with disabilities. So first of all, students with disabilities do not have equal access to those private schools and are often excluded because uh, they have particular admission requirements so, um, and these students are not um, admitted. So they're kind of, they're cherry picking their students. And then additionally, unlike um, public schools, private schools are not required to conform with the federal laws like the IDEA that I just mentioned. So that would that ensure fundamental rights for quality education to students with disabilities because they cannot be held accountable. So this has really, this shift to more um, funding of charter schools has really impacted students also with extensive support needs. I've seen this in my field um, who have not been served at these schools or have been not served well at these schools. So charter schools should not continue to be funded with federal money. And so I hope if you're looking at um, the profiles of the candidates, you'd be looking for um, a candidate that supports that um, standpoint. So in some kind of, I hope that, you know, real issues for people and students with disabilities will be on the agenda in, the, in this coming election. And, that, and that, that will be a reflection of how they're viewed and valued in our society. Thank you very much, uh, Kathleen. I think um, you've done a, a fine job in uh, introducing this very complex and large topic uh, that normally does not get discussed. And so I hope uh, people in the audience will pursue more information about how our educational system the budgeting and the pandemic affects uh, disabled students. So thank you for your presentation and your important work. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Bradley Fogo, who has a PhD from Stanford and holds the position of Assistant Professor of Teacher Education in the Department of Secondary Education. Professor Fogo's primary teaching responsibilities include curriculum and instruction courses for history, social studies teachers. His research focuses on instructional practice, teacher learning, and inquiry-based history, social studies curriculum. Dr. Fogo was the Director of Curriculum and Professional Development for the Stanford History Education Group, where he played a primary role in developing the reading like an historian curriculum. He also worked 10 years as a middle school history social science teacher in California and Chicago. Bradley, you have the floor and thank you very much for participating in this panel. Thanks, Joel. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, it is a pleasure to be joining everyone. I'm going to share my screen here um, to uh, use a couple of slides to uh, supplement my uh, presentation. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a teacher educator and researcher uh, and focus in particular on curriculum and instruction and in teaching methods for elementary and secondary history social studies classrooms, and it is a big year for history social studies education. It's been a big decade. It's been a big century for history social studies education. Um, and I want to begin my talk by laying out a framework uh, that I use with my students, teacher candidates. These are pre-service teachers who are just entering the field. And we use this framework to map our work together. And this is a framework for teacher learning that combines elements of two primary conceptual frameworks, pedagogical content knowledge and, re and, and culturally responsive teaching. I refer to it as critical uh, PCK, which illustrated in this framework is an amalgam of contextualized subject matter knowledge, knowledge of students and pedagogical knowledge. And in my courses, we work together on exploring the interrelationships between these 
variables and how they play out in different learning contexts. And so when we talk about one subject matter knowledge, for example, we are exploring questions like, what's the content that you're going to be exploring with your students? What are the concepts and skills that you want students to engage in? What are the central questions and debates that are surrounding your topics of study? How deeply do you understand these elements of subject matter knowledge? And where do you go to develop your subject matter knowledge? What's your knowledge of recent scholarship uh, in a subject area? And what are your possible biases and misunderstandings, blind spots about subject matter knowledge where you need to uh, address and fill out? And then perhaps most importantly, how are the topics that you are planning to teach relevant to the lives of your students? In addition to issues of subject matter knowledge, we spent a lot of time thinking about how they relate to one's understanding of students. And we spent a lot of time working with teacher candidates and, and, and teachers to develop uh, their understanding of their students. How do your students understand or misunderstand about subject matter knowledge, about the subject matter? What is their relationship to the content that you're going to be exploring? What are the reading, writing, and speaking literacies and learning styles of your students? What are your students' backgrounds, interests, and experience, and how might they relate to subject matter? And what are the learning needs that your students have? Do students have IEPs, individual education plans? And if so, what are students' goals and accommodations? And what might you misunderstand uh, about your students? And as somebody getting into the field of education, um, what do you have to continually do to keep learning about your students? And uh, as you're doing that, thinking about their relationship to the subject areas that you are going to be uh, studying. And part of that then is to get into knowledge of practice. Uh, how do you organize and represent subject matter in the classroom? And, and this kind of pedagogical knowledge is what would separate, say, a historian from a teacher of history or a political scientist from a teacher of political science is that practice that combines subject matter knowledge to particular groups of students in particular learning environments. What instructional strategies, activities, and materials will you use? Which strategies are best suited for the subject matter and for your students? And what materials that you're going to be using are most relevant and accessible to students? Uh, and then how do you communicate or possibly miscommunicate uh, with students? Throughout the classes I teach, we learn with each other to develop understanding within and across these constructs and consider how they interact and are influenced by contextual variables at the school level, at the district level, at the state level, at the federal level. And today, um, it's very important to keep in mind that context for critical teacher education and learning is becoming increasingly more fraught. This is where my presentation kind of intersects with uh, Professor Jens is to think about context here and the context that we are working with teachers to enter into, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, subject matter. Uh, subject matter, uh, all, all the elements of pedagogical content knowledge have been uh, politicized. Uh, pr probably not uh, few as much as subject matter itself. Debates over what should be taught in history social studies classes have played out uh, for decades uh, across states and at the federal level, often surrounding the development of state standards and curriculum frameworks for history social studies. And so again, to kind of get into thinking about the pol policy context of subject matter, uh, it's important to keep in mind that classrooms uh, are nested within schools that have certain policies regarding what is taught and learned in classrooms, which are then nested in districts and counties, which also have influence on subject matter, which are nested in states and then are part of a federal system. And it's the state system really that has uh, I think some of the most power in influencing curriculum and instruction across schools in California. And I have been cautiously optimistic with the direction of curriculum policies and frameworks in California over the past few 
years since the No Child Left Behind era of high stakes accountability, the state, uh, particularly in history social studies, has pivoted away from high stakes testing that focuses on low level recall of voluminous amounts of content. You can imagine high stakes tests that focus on recall have influence on subject matter and pedagogical decision making of teachers at the local classroom level. Instead, the state has de de uh, adapted a new history social science framework that focuses on critical inquiry. They've gotten rid of high stakes testing in history social studies. At the same time, there's new ethnic studies courses, curriculum, and frameworks across districts and new initiatives at the state level. Coupled with ever increasing amount of high quality free online social studies curriculum, such as the Southern Poverty Law Center's teaching tolerance curriculum, the Facing History and Ourselves resources for teachers, uh, the Stanford History Education Group's Reading Like a Historian curriculum, all of these materials and curricular frameworks uh, help support teacher candidates in developing critical pedagogical pedagogical content knowledge, both with access to uh, curriculum frameworks that are more focused on issues of uh, 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 multiculturalism, race, uh, and uh, just broader definitions of, uh, of history social studies. All of this is being challenged today by the Trump administration and conservatives across uh, the country making pronouncements with some pretty alarming rhetoric and initiating policy aimed at undermining what they are deeming un-American history and promoting patriotic education. And this is stuff that's just happening as we speak within the past couple of weeks, primarily at the federal level, but it's happening across at straight, state levels as well. Specifically, uh, President Trump has attacked the 1619 uh, project, uh, the work of Howard Zinn, critical race theory, going so far as to threaten cutting federal funding California schools, uh, while also establishing grants and commissions for developing pro-American history curriculum, uh, all certainly attempting to uh, roll back some of the subject matter progress being made in California. Unlike previous debates over content of history, social science, this is now uh, unfolding in the midst of a high profile uh, election. Uh, issues that are promising to gain steam in the weeks ahead and only increase the already astronomically high stakes uh, of this particular uh, election. I think it's crucial to support teachers and teacher uh, candidates in developing critical pedagogical content knowledge for teaching and learning history social studies, uh, particularly so in the context of a highly charged political landscape shaped increasingly more by far right-wing rhetoric and policy initiatives aimed at narrowing and whitewashing subject matter in history, social studies. Um, and so this is just where we're working in the, the, the milieu of the election of 2020. I, I really don't think stakes could be much higher for history, social studies teachers. And it is something that we are taking on in our methods courses uh, and that I see being addressed across schools in California uh, as well. So um, yeah, that is uh, where we're at in uh, our methods course today. And I will stop sharing my uh, screen. Okay, thank you very much, Brad, for mm -hmm. uh, that insight into history, social studies. As a political scientist, um, I appreciate the the ground that you tried to cover uh, for teachers in the K to 12, um, in the high school, especially uh, teaching controversial subjects in a public school system is truly a challenge. Uh, and you gave good insight into how difficult it can be when uh, political uh, figures want to uh, have that content shaped according to their views uh, and for consistency over time, uh, that's a real, a real difficult issue to navigate. Thank you very much for that presentation. And now it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, 
uh, Dr. Lynn Mahoney, uh, who is the 14th president of the San Francisco State University and the first woman appointed to serve as the university's president in a permanent capacity. I want to thank Dr. Mahoney for making um, the time to appear on this panel. Um, I know well the pressures on you as the chief executive officer uh, for a large university. So we are really thankful uh, for your uh, uh, willingness to share your ideas about higher education. Prior to Dr. Mahoney's appointment at SF State, Dr. Mahoney served as provost and vice president for academic affairs at California State Los Angeles and earlier as the Associate Vice President for Undergraduate Studies and Interim Vice President and Dean of Undergraduate Studies at California State University, Long Beach. President Mahoney received her bachelor's degree in American Studies from Stanford University and a PhD degree in History from Rutgers University. She is the author of Elizabeth Stoddard and the Boundaries of Bourgeois Culture and has lectured and taught extensively on the construction of whiteness in the United States and the construction of gender globally. Dr. Mahoney, the floor is yours on the topic of higher education and the election. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So I just, I, I spent the day, I, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in terms of lived experience and then public policy. I just left the um, California State University Board of Trustees meeting, where in many ways you see the outcomes of elections and politics on higher education. So I was in kind of a laboratory all day and I'll talk about that a little bit. I think it's easy or easier to see the impact of politics and elections, particularly locally on K through 12, and then at the state level on public colleges and universities. But I don't know how, where people are, and I think uh, both Brad and Kathleen alluded to this or addressed it specifically, how critical federal policy has been in shaping what higher education looks like in general. And then that's the context in which private universities, public colleges, public universities operate. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I am a U.S. historian, but I'm looking at Brad, whom I know is, um, knows a lot more about the history of history education than I do. But um, higher education in the U.S., it was not initially a story about access. It was a story about privilege um, and a variety of other things. It's really been in the 20th century that it's been, the, been a story about providing access to higher education. And I just want to highlight two policies, two public policies and acts that, that affected that, and then talk about one in particular. And one that's quite well known is the GI Bill that followed the Second World War in 1944. That enabled, within the first decade, uh, two to three million people, two, two to three million men, to attend higher education. And it started to change the shape and feel and dem demographics of higher education in the U.S. But more profound than that was the shift that occurred in the 1960s. And of course, it's no coincidence that this occurred um, during the Civil Rights Movement. When the Higher Education Act was passed by the federal government that established the principle of federal financial aid for students attending universities, public or private. And for those of us who work in the California State University, some of our uh, sister institutions have as many as 70% of their students on those federal grants. At our own institution here at San Francisco State, it's about 40%. So in many ways, without the establishment of the principle of federal financial aid, many of the state systems would not exist and they would not exist in the way that they do. And I know Brad and I, and I believe Kathleen also mentioned, um, but these gains are always tenuous. When you have changes in administration, in the oversight of the Department of Education, in the legislative branch that renews the Higher Education Act, uh, these are not things we can take for granted. So uh, attention to where candidates stand on support for access to higher education is critically important. And then I think Kathleen noted this quite well, um, it's not always equitable. So there is a lot of conversation about the extent to which, for example, Pell Grants 
um, disproportionately benefit wealthy universities that have large endowments and less funded institutions with smaller endowments, your public colleges and universities tend to benefit less. The other in the 20th century where um, the federal government turned its attention in terms of higher education was toward accountability. And there are two ways to think about this. And I'll talk about the positive way first and the concerning way second. The first is, is to couple access access to higher education with a commitment on the part of educators to make sure that more students earn the degrees they start. In particular, students from low-income backgrounds and students of color. So that kind of attainment agenda, as some call it, um, is largely positive. It's about reducing equity gaps and ensuring equity in attainment as well as access. But it can also be misused and it can be rigidly used for accountability purposes. And I think Kathleen's comments about charter schools or Brad's comments about charter schools are, are in alignment here. And what a rigid accountability agenda can do is it can drive institutions to just want to be more selective. Bring in students with higher SAT scores, higher, um, largely higher SAT scores and more affluent parents because those higher SAT scores are markers of socioeconomic status. And so you could actually have the accountability movement move against the access agenda by holding schools rigidly accountable for um, metrics that don't take into account the importance that, upward mo that, that access has for upward mobility. I am particularly proud of my 12 year career in the CSU because we are, um, uh, have, have embraced access for decades, we have embraced attainment, and we are widely recognized in the top 10 to 25 universities in the country for the upward mobility of our students, meaning that students enter in the lowest uh, economic, socioeconomic brackets, and 10, 15 years later, mid-career later, they have moved up that mobility ladder. And in many ways, to me, that's, that's the promise of higher education, is you take students uh, you take students as they are, and then you leave them transformed. And that can be both intellectually, it can be socially and culturally. And for low income first generation students, it's really important that that's coupled, coupled with upward mobility. So these are the kinds of ways that the federal government can deeply influence the shape of higher education. As a, as a, a long term, in fact, my entire career has been spent at public universities in the State University of New York, first in New Jersey, then in the State University of New York, and then in the CSU. Obviously, this, your state elections, uh, and this is kind of a, a way of, of imploring people to pay attention to those midterm elections, are really, really important for your state colleges and universities. In the CSU, we educate over 400,000 people a year. And if you throw in the combined populations of the University of California, the community college system, and the CSU, you're talking about millions of Californians whose lives are affected by how the state approaches higher education. And I'll just give you three, three areas in which I think it's important to note their role. And first is who they cho choose to serve on. In the CSU case, we call it the Board of Trustees. I believe the UCs call it the, the regents, the Board of Regents or something of regents. And um, they determine our policy. They determine our general education requirements. They determine our tuition. They determine uh, many, many, many things. And so who the governor is, the governor appoints the board. Who you elect for governor really does determine the shape of the CSU. Uh, and the same would be true for other public systems. And then um, maybe more critically, as critically as funding. It is the state that determines our funding. And then in turn, in response to that, how our board treats our tuition. And so uh, last year in 2019, after many, many years of declining budgets, the CSU finally, uh, at least San Francisco State and others, the percentages are a little different depending on the university, but at San Francisco State for the first time in many, in several years, we receive more than half of our funding from the state. But if you look, if you're listening to this and you went to the UCs or the CSU and my husband attended in the 1970s, you attended the CSU for free. And I believe my husband said, I spent $125 a quarter to attend UC Santa Barbara. That is no longer true. 
And so you'll see that increases in tuition are a direct, a direct response to decreases in state funding. So we had this moment in 2019, 2020, where things were looking good. We passed the halfway mark. We were optimistic about another healthy budget, which would have done, done that as well. And then uh, I've heard others refer to co the impact of the pandemic. It turned the world upside down. And it turned the world upside down in terms of the way we deliver education. It turned the world upside down in terms of um, sheltering in place and working and teaching and learning remotely. But it also has had a really devastating effect on the state economy. So the CSU this year re received a $300 million cut, roughly five or 6% of your state operating, of your, of your operating budget. And so uh, now our state elections are even more important. They're even more important when we're in a declining economy than in some ways they are when we're in an ascending economy. Because we are going to need, again, I just told you there are millions of people across the state of California, millions of people enrolled in institutions of public education. And our reliance on state funding helps us keep that affordable. And so as we look toward the next election, this election cycle and the, and the next, the next, uh, it's really important to think about your commitments to public education as you, as you, as you review your, your candidates. And then the final area that they affect education, and this is even more true in K through 12, which uh, Brad and Kathleen uh, uh, mentioned, is in curriculum. They actually do determine curriculum. Just this past month, the state legislature here in California passed a, a piece of curricular legislation for the CSU that for the most part aligns with the values of the CSU and absolutely aligns with the values of San Francisco State. And now all CSU graduates effective 2024-25 uh, will be required to have completed an ethnic studies course in order to earn a degree from the CSU. And again, that aligns beautifully with San Francisco State. We are home to the first College of Ethnic Studies. We have over 8,000 students every semester who take an ethnic studies course. So for us, this, this aligns with our values. And I think it does for many of the CSUs. Um, but that won't, that's not necessarily always true. Um, I am someone made, while again, I fully support an ethnic studies graduation requirement, I am made uncomfortable by, federal, by either federal or state or local legislation of curriculum. Um, I have hundreds and hundreds of very talented faculty here at San Francisco State who know their disciplines, who know their students, who know what a quality education uh, should look like. And um, it is concerning when your legislature, legis legislature legislates curriculum. But again, it goes to demonstrate how important every election is, whether it's a presidential election or a midterm election, that uh, the votes that we cast determine the experience of students, determine the ability of students to attend college, and determine the ability of students to graduate from college. So what I'm most struck by as a university president is the complex ways that federal policy, federal elections, federal uh, office holders and federal policy interact with state elections, policies, with local boards of trustees for individual systems. And then of course the impact on K through 12 all the way down to local is also very complex. So um, I, I think it just gives us a lot to think about as we in, as we participate and i guess my primary message and this is one i, I leave with students all the time is um, the single greatest tragedy is to not vote at all um, the second one is to vote not knowing the, the the consequences of the vote you exercise so um, with that joel i'm very happy to to have been included uh, with with my colleagues here today well thank you very much dr mahoney um i think um, we figured out exactly correctly how much time we need for questions. I will do my best to um, not only select the questions, but also distribute them uh, according to the speaker. Um, there's a question regarding um, special ed for um, Kathleen. Uh, special ed is getting more expensive. How can you finance and improve special education? So as I, as I mentioned in my um, talk, um, you know, it's getting more expensive, but it's not fully funded. So if the federal government would pay their portion, it would look very different. 
Um, so, you know, that would, because, you know, what I know from being in the field all the time is that um, it's, it's very underfunded and, and, and there might be high costs. And um, what I'm guessing is part of those costs have to do with um, lawsuits that happen because um, school districts are um, not complying and, and parents kind of have to resort to filing a lawsuit um, or, or you know, getting into that kind of situation. And then that becomes a huge cost. So, um, so it has to do with the this, this system not working and um, the services not being provided the way they should. So I think that's, that, could, that raises the cost where it shouldn't be, um, you know. Um, and I think it's important to um, see students with disabilities as equal and having equal rights as any other student and having the right to the services and the education that they need, whatever it costs. Okay. There's a question about the Cogswell-Macy Act. What is the current status of the act? And how can people pass, help pass the act? You need to. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I just want to share my screen for this one. OK, so there's a Cogswell Macy Act um, website, which is really great. I'm, I'm really happy with this question. And so there's this one tab is what can you do to help? So here are a couple of ideas. So you can um, call your member of Cong Congress and, and um, get them to support it. So I think um, you know, there's been a lot of progress, but I, I think we still need support and still you know, wanna move forward with this. It, it would be really awesome um, if, if you know, people who are listening to this webinar could um, go to the website and, and get educated on, on the um, Cogwell Macy's Act and, uh, and do some of these things that are suggested here. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, let me see. Um, and let's see. This is an interesting question. How do other countries handle their special education program? OK, well, that's a big question. How much time do you guys have? Um, Pick so two countries that you know. <laughs> yeah, so um, I've worked actually in four countries. So I've, I've worked in special education in Belgium. I was worked in special education in India and I worked in special education in uh, Central America and actually in here. So that's why. So, um, I mean, this, I see a lot of commonalities in that um, it's, it's not considered important enough and uh, the vision is still uh, based on a medical model and segregating students into separate rooms, doing separate things and not seeing them as, seeing their education as a preparation for participation and uh, in society and, and being part of, of our market economy model and, and people can contribute. So I think the vision really drives where students are educated and the quality of their education. So I see that across different countries. I must say, for instance, when I was in India, there was more inclusion because there's a lack of these big institutions. So people had to get creative and, and include people um, in, um, in general ed schools and, and uh, in their local communities. So sometimes I learned a lot about inclusion from being there. Um, so, but in, I must say in every place, it's not a priority. And, um, and what I'm, I've worked a lot, my focus has been um, working with families. That's been the perspective and my in in the system. And it's a struggle for families everywhere. And these mothers are actual heroes. Often they give up their job and, they, and everywhere I've been, they had to really fight. And for the most basic things and for the things that are very obvious to us, um, just to get access, just to participate. And that's why also, for instance, um, Brad and I and a couple of colleagues in the, in the College of Ed are co collaborating so that teachers are becoming more aware of that, that we're working inclusively so that the, the teacher candidates that we train um, have that vision and, and welcome students in their classrooms. Okay, thank you. Dr. Fogo, there's a question that uh, looks like it was uh, stimulated by controversies over American historical figures like George Washington uh, Thomas Jefferson, Teddy Roosevelt, and so on. Is there a need, the questioner wants to know, 
to revise his history curriculum given new knowledge about these figures? Yeah, absolutely. I think history curriculum needs to be uh, constantly revised and updated, similar to the process of, of historical scholarship and historiography, and that uh, one of the problems with state-mandated curriculum is that it tends to be so static. The California History Social Studies uh, standards were uh, enacted in 1998 and have not been updated since. And there have been serious other curriculum policies that have tried to make up for that. Uh, but I don't think policy moves at the level that historical scholarship does. And it certainly doesn't move at the level that current events do. And so absolutely, and, and you know, I am a, uh, an advocate of uh, flexible curriculum uh, that can be localized and that is uh, primarily, um, you know, under the tutelage of, 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 of talented teachers engaging students in uh, accessible problem spaces where students are investigating historical questions and current events, looking at primary and secondary sources and creating some of their own narratives and some of their own answers. And that type of curriculum is constantly being revised because it's being uh, 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 aligned to what's happening in the world today. So um, in short, I would say absolutely, it, it needs to constantly be uh, updated. And I think one of the better ways to do that is to keep it uh, as local as possible and providing uh, greater access to uh, various forms of curriculum and primary and secondary sources for students across K-12. Okay, this one is for you, President Mahoney. What primary improvement do you intend to make at SFSU? So I, I have been, um, for the full 20 years of my administrative career, uh, a relentless advocate for student success. For me, what it's all about is, again, providing access to students to a high quality public education and making sure that far more of them graduate with their degrees. And, and there are lots of moving pieces to that. And, and I saw some of the other questions and I think they're all related to the same answer. First is academic excellence, attracting the, the best faculty we can who are um, interested in teaching our students and engaging in the kind of scholarship that the CSU prides itself on. It's about the student's holistic experience. It's about academic advising and student engagement. And it's about aligning their experience here with their ultimate career and graduate school goals. So lots of moving parts. But to me, I will consider, um, and this is how I have judged my success at other institutions, by the legacy I leave in terms of the number of students we provide access to and the number of students that we successfully graduate. Okay. Um, and I assume that that answer would also apply to a major emphasis of your administration. Yes. And again, it has many, 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 many moving parts. I have just grossly oversimplified it. Okay. Um, we do have a large number of enrolled undergraduate students who I suspect may have never viewed uh, a university president. Uh, and I wonder if you have a specific uh, idea or set of ideas that you would address to them specifically. You know, this is a, a, kind, a kind of a truism, but every now and then um, those things are, are actually true. And, and the, what I, I think I've, I've been advised, but then I've learned the hard way is you get the most out of things you give the most to. That in fact, um, it, it, more of this is in your control than you think it is. So what I implore students to do is um, make this your primary focus for four, for four years. Um, even if you have to work part-time, I, I know I did and many of my colleagues worked you know, 15 or 20 hours um, a, a week while in school. And I know we have students who work more than that. But as best you can, make this your primary um, experience for the next four years. Get involved outside of the classroom, get to know your faculty, 
Um, you have many faculty who sit lonely during office hours and they would like to be less lonely. So get to know your faculty, get involved with student government, join a club or organization, go to a basketball game, uh, whatever it is. Um, the more you invest in us and take advantage of the remarkable resource we are, the more transformative this experience will be for you. So um, I know sometimes, particularly right now during the pandemic, none of us feel like we're in the driver's seat. We kind of feel like we're on a pandemic roller coaster and we're just being pulled around. But um, we have more control over our daily lived experience than we sometimes think we do. So um, San Francisco State is an incredible resource. Um, you know, take advantage of it and demand that we do the best we can by you. Terrific. One more question for you, uh, Dr. Mahoney. I can imagine all the challenges that you've had to face. Can you pick out something that really is enjoyable and fun to be a college president? Yeah, until March 9th or so, it was almost all fun. Um, since March 9th, it's been a little bit harder. But um, there are two things that are really, really fun. One is, again, just getting to know our students. Um, and even now, while I can't, while there's no one out on the quad and no one in front of Cesar Chavez, um, I have regular Zoom meetings. Last night, I participated in an event with some master students in the Graduate College of Education. I meet regularly with associated students. Um, but the thing that I really have discovered is really quite a bit of fun is, is getting to know our alumni and friends of the university. Um, we have remarkable alumni and remarkable friends of this university who want to help us. And what a joy it is to just go out and about and tell them how wonderful the faculty are, how wonderful the students are, and um, solicit their help. And so that's a joy too, uh, talking about us publicly and, and, and sharing our stories. Terrific. And perhaps the last question, uh, this question concerns uh, President Trump's use of the term patriotic history. Did he make clear what he means by that? And um, do the education officials uh, elaborate or clarify? I guess we have two historians uh, in the bottom panel. What does he mean by patriotic history? Either of you. <laughs> Well, I would say, and I will, I, I'm, I'm curious to hear what President Mahoney has to say, but I, you know, it's uh, similar to a lot of things that uh, President Trump says it's not, uh, there's not a lot of nuanced details so far. Uh, and it's a lot about what it's not than what it is. Um, and it's not the type of critical lenses that we have worked to bring to uh, classrooms to help students become critical consumers of information and active participants in their communities uh, dedicated to issues of social justice. It's not any of that. What it is is a story of whitewashed progress uh, populated by uh, uh, fictitious heroes in some ex to some extent um, and, and uh, doesn't pay attention to racism, doesn't pay attention to economic and social inequalities, doesn't pay attention to the problems that we are working on to improve the country. The, the only, Dr. Fogo answered that perfectly, but so let me just, the only thing I would add is that I would urge us to reclaim the expression. And to me, the most patriotic kind of history is the one that demands us to be better. True patriotism is admitting our flaws, recognizing our weaknesses, and, and committing to continuous improvement. So I urge us to redefine what patriotic history means. Okay, that's terrific. Um, let me just give you a chance since we have a moment, if uh, any of you would like to make one final point before we adjourn the webinar, uh, that would be fine. Anyone want to make a final point? Uh, Dr. Mahoney, you said that Dr. Fogo knows a lot about history of teaching history. Um, if I wanted to be provocative, could I not say that when hasn't the teaching of history in America not been patriotic? I know a little bit about uh, the teaching of history, 
Uh, and it seems to me when uh, Professor Jen talks about the federal level and the state level and the local level of government, they are not really going to uh, get to the kind of critical lenses, I think, that you talk about. And uh, my limited understanding, and I would certainly defer to your greater knowledge, is that the teaching of history in K-12 has always been uh, to put America in the best light. Well, what I meant by redefining patriotism is not putting America in the best light. I okay. think a patriotic history is one that is a critical history of America. So I would argue by my definition of what a patriotic history is, anytime you censor a textbook, you are not engaging in patriotic history. You are, I think one of, um, someone in one of the comments here might've talked about a whitewash. Um, so I actually was urging that we redefine patriotic history, not to be jingoistic and nationalistic, but to be in fact hypercritical, that the most patriotic act we can do is to be critical of ourselves in the pursuit of loftier goals. Terrific. Dr. Fogo, do you want to comment on that? I, I just agree uh, with with uh, President Mahoney and would, would also say that I think there, and I, I really like the idea of repurposing that idea of patriotic education and that truly patriotic civics education is engaging students in hard history and difficult issues and creating the, uh, bringing the resources to the materials and the scaffolds and structures to promote civil discourse around hard issues. And that I think is a very patriotic space and speaks to the importance of the history social studies classroom uh, in America today. And I guess I would leave that on my note today is to, you know, the, the, the incredible challenges of 2020 in working with history social studies teachers and working with history social studies teacher candidates uh, I am finding real community and optimism uh, because there is a space there to address the challenges that we're confronted with in this country. And it is a very generative space. It's a very optimistic space. It's a very relational space uh, that I have been buoyed by in the course of this semester, even in a distance teaching learning environment, be getting on a Zoom call and be working with people to think about how do you take on hard history in this challenging environment, in this medium. Um, I, we could go on for a while, but I, I have um, a, a lot to be hopeful for with the students that I'm working with uh, in the Graduate College of Education, San Francisco State. If I can be permitted one final comment that tries to uh, en encompass both of your comments. As a political philosopher myself, we emphasize critical thinking. And what I hear you both saying is that you think the best teaching of hist American history would be bringing critical thinking perspective to the events and, and for us to be um, critics of what in fact has developed and then look forward to how we can use that critical thinking produced knowledge to improve the future and not make the same mistakes uh, we have made in the past. Um, and if that's true, then that really is a, 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 an optimistic note from you, Professor Fogel, which is really hard to get these days. Um, and we haven't actually had one such ending in the previous sessions. So I want to give a special thank you to you educators for giving us a positive ending. And I want to thank uh, both uh, Kathleen and Brad and, and, and Lynn for having, uh, and Professor Jen who needed to leave to do his duty with his local board um, uh, uh, of, of education uh, for having a really wonderful and uh, enjoyable and enlightening session. I want to thank you all. And to answer one of the chat uh, questions, information about the quiz will be sent to you via email.
and that's important along with curriculum oh we need to make sure everybody understands um the way in which uh you will be uh challenged to reflect on these panels thank you one and all thank you for the viewers for tuning in and next week we go from education uh, to a relatively small and uncontroversial topic, immigration. And we will deal with immigration next week. Thank you all and have a great evening. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you. Sure.